Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, the Evolution Symposium on Higher Education in the Workforce. My name is Amr Dalawalia. I'm uh, the managing editor of The Evolution. The Evolution is an online newspaper focused on non traditional higher education. What really sets us apart is that our focus is on you know, the people who really make the change and make the innovation in the higher education space. And all our content comes from those people, from system presidents to provosts to deans and directors to program managers to students and employers and everyone in between. These are the people who are providing our content. And these are the people who are sharing their thoughts on our website. The Evolution was founded two and a half years ago by Destiny Solutions. Uh, they're a company that, that makes business management software for non-traditional uh, divisions of higher education institutions. The Destiny President CEO, uh, Shaul Cooper, was actually behind the evolution in a lot of ways. He founded the evolution because when he looked out into the higher ed space, the, the biggest problem that he saw, the biggest barrier he saw to change was the fact that the people who are actually innovating, the people who are making change, and the people who are driving for innovation were unable to communicate with one another. Forget from country to country or from state to state, people weren't able to innovate and share their ideas within their own institutions. That's why the evolution exists. Those are the people that we're trying to bring together. And it's that commitment to community and change and, and, and that vision for the future that's actually led us to become the leading resource for non-traditional higher education. We have over 40,000 visitors a month coming to the evolution to read our articles, to share their thoughts, and to be a part of this change and this focus on moving higher ed forward. Tonight, for the first time ever, we're taking that conversation offline. We're going to be presenting three snapshot talks by people on very diverse ends of the higher ed space. We have someone coming from an employer's perspective, looking to really change the way that higher education interacts with, with their employee partners. We're, we have a student who's, who's going to share her own experiences and share her thoughts on, on where she's coming from and, and what she sees this industry being. And we have an administrator who's going to share his own perspective and his own work in actually helping to bridge this gap. So I hope you enjoy. Please sit back, relax. It's going to be a great evening. Uh, it's going to be very innovative. And uh, I appreciate everybody coming out. So to start off, we're going to have Maggie Johnson speak. She is the Director of University Relations at uh, Google. And uh, please welcome her. Okay, thank you, and thank you for joining us this evening. So um, as, as Amrit told you, I'm Director of Education and University Relations at Google. Um, I work with all the teams that do a lot of the um, internal engineering education. So I thought I'd uh, talk a little bit about how we sort of satisfy the needs for continuing ed education just for our own engineers. So when I think about continuing education for Google's engineers, there's really three areas that it encompasses. The first is technical skill development. The second is soft skill kinds of things like leadership development, people management, and then the third are more tactical things like project and program management and time management, things along those lines. So what I thought I'd do is just take you through each of those and, and talk a little bit about how we, how we take care of those things for our engineers. So the first guiding principle we have is that we do not create any internal training if we don't have to. So we look everywhere to try and find the right resources um, externally because it's just a, a much better way to try and make these things work. So we really look externally and do everything we can to uh, work with higher ed in order to uh, satisfy the needs that we have. So starting with uh, probably the easiest one, which is tactical skill development, it's a really great example of how we have leveraged um, our, our friends here at Stanford to uh, help us satisfy one really important need, which is with pro uh, project and program management. There's a uh, program here, the Advanced uh, Project Management course that's offered uh, through the Center for, for Professional Development. And this is the perfect course for our Googlers. These are, you know, it's a course that covers both tactical skills, it, it covers strategic design and planning, everything really they need. So we've just sent hundreds of Googlers through that course, and it's a great example of a connection between higher ed and industry that works really well for us. So that one's, that's one example. With time management, which is the other tactical skill that we, we need to you know, provide, that one has been a little bit harder to do just externally uh, for a couple reasons. First of all, we have uh, a lot of systems that uh, take care of different aspects of time management that need to get included uh, in any training we might provide. But the second thing has to do with our new graduates. We have 
thousands of new graduates coming into Google every year. And they have some special needs uh, in terms of time management. And they're making this transition from academia to their first job. And time management is hard for them. You know, all of a sudden they, you know, don't have the structure they had previously. There's a lot of things thrown at them. They have to prioritize very quickly. And it's just a very different situation for them. A couple years ago, we did some focus groups uh, with our Nooglers, what is what we call them. Um, they were about six months old, and then we did them again at about a year old. And what we were really trying to understand was what were those challenges that they were having during this transition. And besides time management, that was the first one, uh, they also had problems with just the, you know, being self-driven and working independently. Because that's something that, you know, when you're, you have a very, a lot of structure when you're a student. You've got courses, you've got problem sets, you've got deadlines, you've got all the things that you're doing as a student. And then you move into the job, um, you know, in, indus in industry, and all of a sudden you don't have that structure. You are like, you know, you might have deadlines, but it never feels like you're done. So it was a very, it's a very different feeling for them. The other things that came up were just etiquette around email and chat, which is quite different on the job than it is when you're a student. Uh, things like being able to present coherently to a group of people and be able to communicate your own thoughts. That's another thing that they just didn't get enough practice with. What to do with a manager, which is a completely foreign concept to them. And then the last one was really uh, how to play well with others. Because it's, it's quite possible as a student that you can avoid working with people that you don't like, but it's just not possible on the job. So that's another thing that comes that came up during those focus groups. But we really have tried to, to help our new grads coming in to deal with these transition points. And, and they're really important. They are soft skills that they really don't get a lot of practice with when they're students. OK, so that's the tactical ones. The soft skill ones around leadership development and people management, uh, again, there are a lot of really excellent external programs that do leadership development. And we, um, we use them. We, you know, selectively, we certainly send people to those. But we've had to do a lot of uh, our own uh, development for the, le the leadership programs we offer for our engineers. And this has to do with the fact that our, our culture is, um, has some unique attributes. So some of those attributes are, first of all, we, we try and hire really brilliant people. Um, our hiring process is, is very difficult to get through. And we end up with uh, people that, where there's an expectation that they should be able to play a leadership role when it's appropriate. Everyone should be able to play a leadership role. So that requires some training. The second aspect of our culture that's, that's really important is uh, it's a somewhat flat hierarchy. So for anyone who's an individual contributor, they should have access to their director, to their VP, to their SVP. There should be that open line of communication, and that sh there should be that accessibility. And, it, and there, it's there. I mean, I, 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 could get a, I could get a meeting with Larry Page if I wanted to. Um, that's all available to me. I better make sure it's a good use of his time. But it's, that is just a part of our culture. The other thing is just transparency. So every week we have a TGIF globally. And the founders are always there. The senior leadership of the company is there. And it's very open conversations about what's going on in the company. And very, you know, there's a Q&A period where direct questions are asked and direct answers are given. So that transparency and that kind of communication within the company is, again, is something that people need to get used to. And, and you need to be able to deal with it. The third thing that's a part of our culture is just innovation. I mean, this is something that we foster in all kinds of different ways. You may have heard of our 20% program. This is where uh, engineers can spend one day a week just doing something creative. And it could be about you know, having to do with the product they're working on, or it could be just um, something that they, they want to work on. So that helps to you know, keep that uh, feeling of innovation very much a part of the culture. So these things are really um, parts of our culture that we want to preserve. And in order to do that, we've really had to uh, develop a lot of homegrown programs to help with that. We have a, a, an initial leadership pro uh, development program that pretty much, pretty much every engineer goes through from sometime, sometime between six months and two years um, during that tenure. And this is really where we present all the things I just sort of talked about and help them understand how to get acclimated to that culture. We also have two more advanced programs. The uh, uh, first one is for upper middle management in engineering, and then there's one for directors and above. Now, the one for um, upper middle management, we have a really interesting situation that occurs. We have two job ladders in engineering. One is for our software engineers, individual contributors, and that goes from like level two all the way up to Google Fellow like a Jeff Dean. 
And then we have an engineering management ladder that goes from level five all the way up to SVP, like an Alan Eustis or Susan Wojcicki. And what happens around level five or L6, you know, those levels, this is when someone who's been doing people management and engineering, they have to make a decision whether or not they're going to stay an individual contributor and maybe go a tech lead kind of route or whether they're going to actually become a people manager and a team manager and an organizational manager and deal with strategy product design on that management ladder. And this is a huge decision for a software engineer because when you make that transition to the management ladder, you're not going to code anymore. And that's a big career changer. So that one uh, leadership development program helps these managers make that decision. So that's what that program's about. The, uh, the third one then is the directors and above, and that's really about um, building the bench for the next you know, set of senior leaders in the company. So we do a lot of homegrown, and, and again, it's because of our culture. For people management, we have a lot of uh, internal systems and our internal performance management system, which is proprietary. So there's a lot of you know sort of uh, specific things we have to do there. But pretty much everything else we outsource. So coaching, negotiation skills, ha handling difficult conversations, all of those kinds of things that people managers need, we bring in the experts or we send people out for those. So that expertise is not something that we have internally. OK, so finally then is technical skills. And this is obviously what we spend the majority of our time on. Now, one of the things about um, our engineers, and this is really in any, pretty much any high tech company in, uh, in Silicon Valley, we have an expectation that they are able to shift gears and learn new tools and technologies very quickly. And I was at Stanford for about 15 years before I went to Google. And I, I worked in the uh, computer science department, did a lot of curriculum development. And I understand where that trait comes from, where you know, a really good engineer can really quickly change, change and pick something else up. Because it's like built into the program. Now, when we did um, back, you know, this is a, a couple years ago, the program we had, the first course was in Java. The second course was in C++. The third course, you had to learn three languages in a quarter, including a functional language, assembly language, and C. And then as you got into the upper level courses, you had your operating systems course. You might write um, all the operating system in uh, C++. The compilers course, you would write your compiler in C and compile an object-oriented language. We just mixed it up on them constantly. So every quarter, they had to switch again. And this is very common for most of the, you know, the top tier um, computer science programs, where they really are helping students to develop that trait. And this is something we expect. So when we have uh, an engineer at Google who has to learn Python for whatever reason, we don't teach Python 101. There are just a bazillion great resources externally for them to go and learn basic Python or any generic skill. That's something that they're expected to be able to do. But when it comes to using Python at Google, where you know, you've got to know libraries, you've got to know the infrastructure, you've got to know all the services and all of the specific things about how we do it internally, that we do have to help them with. So our team uh, that, that focuses on uh, internal engineer education for technical education, we do three things. The first is we have an orientation program that's really intense. It's about two weeks long. It's very hands-on. You have to learn all the build systems. They have to learn all the infrastructure, all the testing frameworks. They actually build a little search engine from start to finish on our infrastructure. And then they start getting acclimated to the culture. They also, each Nugler has a mentor who helps them during that whole first month. So they go through uh, orientation, and then they are off on their starter project, and they start on their project team. Now, there are a number of large training programs that we have had to develop over the years because of business need. One of them, just as a, a, an example, about seven or eight years ago, we used to do all of our testing via having like a 1,000 contractors in a building who were just banging away at the software. So that's how we did testing. And then a decision was made that we needed to have that responsibility go to the engineers. So rather than having a bunch of contractors banging away at software and then another army of engineers fixing bugs and have that be our workflow, what we did was we had the engineers learn how to do unit tests, learn testing frameworks, learn test-driven development, and they had to you know, start taking responsibility for it. Now, this was not just a skill development. We had you know, a whole set of tools had to be uh, created, but it was a culture shift, too. 
So this was a very big change in the way that they did their work. So that's an example of something that we, you know, we had to get in place and help sort of shepherd through. Now that has become so important that it's actually an orientation. And now every single engineer has to go through that when they come right in the door. So that's one example. Another example is about six years ago, we changed um, all of our user interfaces. I'm sure you remember. Uh, but about six months prior to that, we were asked to create a training program on um, user interface design, front end engineering, because at that time, three quarters or more of our engineers were all back end engineers. They were all working on the core infrastructure that runs Google. And our interfaces were very simple, right? It's just like the box in search. But around that time, we were doing Gmail, we were doing apps, we were starting to do a lot of things that had some really, you know, much more involved um, user interfaces. So we developed this uh, sequence of courses that every single engineer had to go through. Whether you're a back end or front end, whatever, you, everyone needed to develop the sensitivity around user interfaces and what, what it really meant. So that was created. Now every engineer has to go through that in, the, in their first six months. And then there's at least a half a dozen more such programs we've had to build. We're working on two of them additional ones right now. Now, another thing about all of these programs is that everything that we do has to be done in multiple modalities. So we have 40 engineering offices around the world, and we, we need to be able to offer our programs face-to-face, -face, you know, small classroom kinds of things. We need to be able to allow people to VC into a classroom if they want to do it, but they happen to be in India. And we have to videotape everything, so you want to watch the video, you can do that. It has to be available via e-learning, via documentation, any way you want to learn it, we have to make it available, um, just because we're such a distributed company. The, the last thing I wanted to talk about is, is something that, that's a little more innovative that we get to do, and that has to do with just-in-time learning. So if you look at how engineers work, they have a workflow that they follow. You know, They write their code, and then they put their unit tests in, and then they, they do the build and compile, and then they're testing, and then code reviews, and it's just this whole process they go through. Now, if they have a question or they need help in the middle of that process, the last thing they want to do is leave that context, go out and find documentation or a training module to help them with that question. That is not good for productivity. So what we've done is we build a whole bunch of hooks into the systems they use um, for you know, implementing that workflow and provided means by which they can get the information they need in the moment. So an example of this is that we've uh, built a uh, an internal stack overflow type system, a question answer system, and it's available throughout that entire workflow. Because what we found is that 70% of the questions they ask have been asked before. We just have to save the answers and surface them at the right time. And doing that has just been a huge um, uh, help with productivity, and that's something that obviously is very much a part of what we have to do. So, um, so anyway, I think that's, I, I wanted to give you an overview. I hope that is helpful. And uh, if you have any questions, is that something we do here, or is that outside? Uh, so if you have any questions for Maggie, uh, please feel free to approach her uh, during the cocktail hour that's going to follow. Um, Maggie, okay. thank you so much. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Uh, so our next speaker is a, a student from uh, UCLA, a recently graduated student from UCLA. Yay! Uh, and the chairperson <laughs> of uh, UCLA's non-traditional student network, uh, Heather Adams. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I am a non-traditional student. I um, have been in the workforce for over 20 years. And before I transferred to UCLA, where I just completed my bachelor's degree, yay, 20 year plan. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I attended community college. And my first day at community college was rather nerve-wracking, to say the least. Trust me, when you're 30-something years old with a backpack <laughs> and you find someone with a shared experience, any shared experience, you're like, oh, thank God, you're over 23, let's talk. And this is how I met Robert. It turns out that Robert uh, served in the military, Air Force, and where he managed an equivalent of a multi-million dollar corporation. To put it in top gun terms, he would be the guy talking to the pilots, directing them where to go. Effectively, telling the guys talking to the pilots what to do. He also managed about 30 people, pilots and technicians. He was in charge of procuring all the necessary gear and equipment. And he managed a budget of $2 million a year. But, even though he was so highly skilled and experienced, he couldn't get a job. 
And this just, just didn't make sense to me. How is someone who so, has so much work experience not valued in the workforce? And as it turns out, this is not, this situation is not unusual. It's not unique. And I realize, obviously, that it's because employers require degrees and even the most entry-level positions um, of jobs that are worth having or sort of worth having requires letters after your name. So as an adult student, though, with significant work, work experience, you feel like you're floundering when you're sitting in a classroom surrounded by students half your age talking about the theory behind the skills that you've been practicing in your professional career for years. And I just wanted to do something to help people like Robert earn their degrees and get them jobs. So I felt like the non-traditional students are a valuable resource, a viable resource, and we needed to make that clear to people and clear to employers. So that's when I decided I needed to take a leadership role. And on top of creating a group that focused on transfer student advocacy, I served for two years as a chair of UCLA's non-traditional students network. Our job was to bridge the gap between students and faculty and administration and help non-traditional students pursuing their four-year degree. We set out to reinforce the idea and the recognition of prior learning experience and, and guide students to the resources that they need to be successful in finishing their university and uh, finishing their time at the university. This, we thought, would help more adults get their bachelor's degree. So they could be better prepared for the workforce and uh, get a job and keep a job. We definitely made progress, but it soon became very clear to us that working within the system wasn't enough. What non-traditional and transfer students really need is for the system itself to change. But students can't really do that alone. After all, its problem goes much deeper than the lack of degrees. It really, the problem is more systematic. It goes to what degrees are designed for and, what out, and the outcomes that they're meant to achieve. So this system is built to facilitate learning for learning's sake. It focuses on the idea that university students will end up remaining in academia and contribute to society's pool of knowledge. Now, keep in mind, this is coming from somebody who highly values liberal arts education. I mean, heck, I was 20 years to get my degree. So I do value it, and I do think there's some important, there's so much important about the liberal arts education. However, much of the content that's learned in these degree programs rarely points towards the business world and are relevant to the workforce that students will be in when they graduate or even while they're at school. So as students, we can certainly be active in demanding to learn topics that lead directly to the workforce-focused outcomes, but how can we know what we don't know? We're, we're not in a position where we can ask for significant change to the curricula, and we can't teach teachers how to teach. Yet there's still this gap in what is taught in the classroom versus the pragmatic skills that are, contribute to being successful in today's economy. So, What's, what's the answer, right? Well, I think what is needed to close the gap between higher education and the workforce is a one-two punch where students are pushing from one side and employers from the other. Employers are very vocal about the fact that graduates are unprepared for the labor market, that's clear, but what are they really doing? I mean, my, Maggie had actually a lot of really interesting points, which I didn't know about, but from my vantage point, it didn't, doesn't seem like all that much. I certainly have some ideas, though. So at base level, I think that employers should start communicating with the universities. They need to talk to faculty and talk to provosts and even the presidents of these universities about what they need from graduates. I mean, how else are, are schools going to know? And more importantly, how, how else will degree seekers learn the skills they need to succeed in the workforce if this kind of communication isn't a priority? To take it a step further, businesses could get some skin in the game by getting more involved in the program planning process. I mean, wouldn't it be terrific if employers worked in parallel with faculty to develop programs that meet teaching aims and accreditor demands while still preparing students for the labor market? I think that would be so cool, I'm just saying. Uh, and this would definitely, this could create possibly an applied liberal arts, applied liberal arts system. A system in which the students could actively participate in the learning process 
and that will serve them outside of the classroom. Business, businesses could also identify gaps in, help identifying gaps in, in resources that are at the school, or at universities, such as lack of career centers, lack of transfer centers, lack of uh, uh, workforce courses. Um, and universities could, universities don't have the funds necessarily to, to um, initiate this. So businesses could definitely come in and, not, and help fill that gap. This program planning, though, I think can extend from the academy to the office. And one of the greatest characteristics of non-traditional students, for instance, is our professional experience. And we have the soft skills needed to work in, the, in, in a working environment. And non-traditional non students really have, have, that, have a step up on traditional students in that arena. However, all students can learn from a, work, a benefit from work experience in their academic program. And employers, of course, would benefit too. This is one area where some leaps have definitely been made. We have co-op programs already existing, but I feel like there needs to be more of an alignment between the classroom learning and workplace outcome. So maybe we could change the higher education system and have students spend a year of their university or even high school time working apprenticeship style. They, they could learn, have more time and opportunity to apply the knowledge that they're learning to the job. And in the case of non-traditional students, maybe the programs could focus on technical issues and business issues that would make them competitive. So I'm certainly not blind to the challenges here that, that are in the way of some of these concepts that I've brought up and some that I think could still be applied. But I think that the main problem is businesses aren't communicating with universities, and universities are hesitant to communicate with businesses. The university system was originally set up for the wealthy. It is relatively stuck in a, in a system that it's been stuck in for centuries. And now we want, or well, we need, a high, higher education system that effectively and successfully serves everyone. And that's not what we have right now. Universities, they seem <coughs> apprehensive about business and about their intentions. And universities are not terribly interested in innovation. And this is not for lack of wanting. It's, it's just because of the systematic habit. And unfortunately, many times, even the most minor changes are seen as these massive disruptions. Uh, MOOCs are a prime example. They put lectures online and they made them open to ever free to watch and we call this massive innovation. We need universities and students and faculty and businesses to be more open, embrace these changes and do it quickly. Second, I think students can work within the system to change their standing, but they can't change the system itself. A system overhaul is really what we need. And this could be one that has to turn the traditional higher education system on its head, or at the very least, create a higher education stream for students whose aim is to wind up working outside of academia. But this is really almost impossible for students to do on their own. Finally, employers are business running, uh, busy running their businesses. They, uh, they're ex it's extremely difficult for them to take a leading role in planning academic programs. Uh, and traditionally, we've relied on universities and schools to do this. So we're starting to see some collaboration between, uh, at the institutional level between students and the university. Remember my friend Robert? Uh, he just got selected to be the UCLA representative of the UC Veterans Advisory Board. So he, the entire UC system is, wants to work with him to make sure that students like him are served well. So on the positive note, some of the universities are starting to work and collaborate with their students. What we now need is for employees, employers and administration and faculty to start collaborating. We need businesses and the business world and the academic world to stop working at arm's length from one another and then and only then can students see the outcomes that we need to succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, so much for that. That was great. Um, so to finish off, 
Uh, we have Edward Abeda. He is the director of K-16 programs at the University of California, uh, San Diego Extension. And he's the co-founder of, of Steam Connect. Uh, Ed, please. So we're, we just had some uh, remarkable comments today from uh, industry. And we also have some great comments from a student perspective. So today, my hope today is to actually bridge the divide. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about a perception gap. It's an emerging topic in our country, and it's a perception gap that hits corporations and higher institutions of higher learning. And specifically, the perception gap is around work preparedness. So today, I want to have a little bit of a conversation with you on what are the data behind and evidence that supports that we have a problem in the first place, and possibly actually look at some exploration of some solutions in the process. So let's start off with, uh, so is there a problem anyway? So. I once learned at universities they want evidence. That's really great, but we not have evidence. So I always start out with a quote, and God we trust, the rest bring data. For those of you from California, we might hear uh, Ronald Reagan, he says, uh, I trust you, but I just need verification. So, well, an interesting poll just came out in the 2014, Gallup poll. And in that poll, 96% of corporations said, well, gosh, we're not having our students prepared for the workforce excuse me, 11%. And on the other side, you have higher ed leaders. They actually showcasing that they actually think that they're doing a great job. 96% of all the chief of academic officers are saying, you know, we're doing a good job. Your investment's good. But this is a remarkable finding, especially when you think students are investing thousands of dollars in the effort to go through school. And this is before they even get to school. They're in high school meeting requirements, A through G making sure they do the internships. And then, of course, you have to kneel down, go to the altar, and beg God, please let me get into this institution, the Cathedral of Learning, because that's my ticket. It's the Wonka ticket. Only then will I go on and succeed and be successful in life. But that's not, not true. Not necessarily. And co corporations should also have just as much alarm, because they're relying on institutions. Because institutions of higher learning are the pipeline for the future. So. If we actually know there's a problem, something is really, really going on here when we actually look in the mirror, if I'm higher education, and I'm looking good. In fact, I'm going to give myself an A+. Plus. And in that same mirror, someone beside them is looking in the same mirror and saying, oh, no, you got it all wrong. I'm giving you an F. And if we're preparing our workforce for the 21st century, we've got a problem. In fact, Barack Obama recently said that workforce preparedness is through education to get the jobs of the 21st century. And more importantly, it's a way to rebuild our middle class. So where do we go from here? Well, today I'm going to talk about some radical steps. And I think it's remarkable that we're here with evolution in the workforce symposium. Because too long we've been second. Not because we were put there, but because sometimes we placed ourselves there. And today, as continued education folks, we have an opportunity to flip the equation. And I think it starts with us having a voice and starting our own rankings. I think we actually need to look at a model that was traditional, it's outdated, and was built on an outdated time. It was a manufacturing model we've heard today. It built cogs, widgets, running through the pipeline, metrics, you know, the whole Six Sigma, all the different uh, engineering principles. I hear some engineers here from Stanford, so I think that might connect a little bit. But if your work preparedness in Stanford and other higher institutions are not fulfilling the needs of Google and other incorporations, then we've got a problem. So instead of looking at rankings from the way that higher education looks at them, I mean, you know how they rank education. You know, you, you have parents, you get ready to go looking at all the schools. You go look at all the magazines. We're ranked number one in research. We have the best faculty you could ever have. In fact, if you're lucky, at Stanford, you could even walk on our grass. <laughs> but it's not just about Research and dollars and federal dollars, is it? It's more than that. It's about work preparedness. And how about now we flip the equation and have our own standard on ranking institutions on work preparedness? How can we, as continuing educators, flip the equation and take all the important data so Google doesn't have to worry by the time they actually bring them in orientation and work on time management skills? Working with others? In fact, some people would even say in corporations they need to learn how to pack. In fact, in this day and age, how do you actually talk to someone without social media on your phone? Kids are walking around like this. How are you? Good. Text me. 
You know, those are some soft skills, and those are things we need to really learn. So you move move forward from this model. You need to know one thing: in rankings at higher institutions, may rank themselves good at job placement. That does not mean that they're prepared for the job. So again, I reiterate, we need to flip the equation. We have the power with all our membership of continuing education to start looking what the criteria of that is, working with our stakeholders and industry, and perhaps looking. It's not just important to have the rankings, which traditionally they are important. We're just not dismissing them. But it's equally important that the investment we make in our tax dollars, that our household income, that all the other uh, folks in our region and the community we serve know that the money we spend are getting the most and the maximum ROI that we possibly can. So I'll move on, and I've got to tell you, I have a confession to make. I'm a lifelong learning continuing education junkie, and I'm really having a hard time, because I actually came into the world of higher education, and the inspiration for this was this woman named Mary. There's something about Mary. and. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about the movie, the one that we actually said there's something, Cameron Diaz, and Lord knows I'd like to do some interviews and talk about it, but I'm talking about the one on the right, Mary Walshuk. And when I first came into the university setting, I was always wondering about why is it that we talk about lifelong learning and uh, we're the second tier to some of these folks in the industry or second tier to the faculty and things of that nature. And she was the first one to actually say to me, we are second to no one. You know, if you're an undergraduate, you get four to five, well, in this day, six years, uh, but you get to go through your undergraduate career, perhaps go on to grad school and so on. But we're in the lifelong learning business. And the lifelong business of learning means we start before they get to college, and God forbid, we get them for the rest of their lifetime. So in fact, we get them more than they actually get in college. And God forbid, even if they do get an education, they still got to come back. They got to come back and continue just the way doctors, teachers, refining their craft, not only is it, was it great that I got to understand, wow, this is a whole industry. It didn't work like the campus models, the traditional models. We didn't have the bureaucracy. In fact, we ran like a business. We ran with a bottom line. We understood that if you didn't actually have an opportunity to work with industry and actually understand how to make things work, then you'd be out of, out of a job yourself because the classes wouldn't run. And that's where I go to my next point, and I want to talk about we are in continuing education bridge builders. We're bridge builders in the sense that we know how to connect to corporations, right? I mean, I'm not talking about the higher education model where we actually have corporations that serve on alumni and advisor boards. Because when I first came into continuing education, my friends used to always tell me, oh my God, why did you, why? Why did you go into continuing education? I mean, like I've, like I've got a scarlet letter. I mean, let me correct that. Most of the faculty love the fact that I was in continuing education largely because they love the money that they could generate. But did they ever actually bring me in, or the leadership, into the inner sanctum? You know, that holy grail. We have to lay down a lot of different uh, scribes and chants and get into the inner sanctum of, God forbid, tenure, research, academic freedom. No, what actually goes on here is that we know how to bridge for the whole lifetime. And we're more than just a cash cow. We are a complement and a bridge. And a funny thing happened in why I got into education. I started out as administrator, going through a student affairs track, went in as a registrar. You know those people, you just all the policies and registration. Thank you, Shaw, for uh, Destiny Solutions for making our pain go away. And I knew there was a moment in time where I wanted to make a change. And I thought, gosh, I'm not going to take it anymore. There's a leadership role we can take. And in 2008, I had the fortune of having an opportunity to apply for a position with the University of California. And in 2008, I was sitting in San Francisco, over in Oakland, uh, going across the bridge and having dinner. And one of my friends in this room and I were sitting when the president of the University of California called me and said, I got to congratulate you, you've just been appointed to the Board of Regents as a staff advisor. And for two years, I had an opportunity during the di difficult downturn and going through furloughs and exploring uh, pension plans and arising in the pillars uh, rising costs and pillars of the UC family, which was built on affordability, quality, and access. And as I went through the period of going through all these different schools and seeing so many different various models of education, I realized lifelong learning is where it's at. When all these things are going wrong and we don't have any money, who are they turning to? 
Continue education, why? Because they knew how to run things on a leaner budget, they knew how to get results, and they were business-minded, and God forbid, they actually knew how to connect to industry, or bridge builders. And during that period of time, I realized, after Mary, you know, the, the one we were talking about, something about, she was telling me about, you should go back to school and get your PhD, and then I did. Went back, finished my PhD in, in post-secondary education, but I realized after that experience in 2010 that lifelong learning doesn't start at 25. So many of you continue education. I go to these conferences, predominantly it's about adult education, but it's not. Hence, in 2010, I embarked on creating a 2010 uh, dream, and that is K through 16 programs. You see family to actually go year round, bridge to our community, and have opportunities, not just for experiences, for students to have experiences in the university, but also connect to industry, get the skills, and break down barriers. So ultimately, before they even get in college, they wouldn't be strapped with the load and issues that they face changing majors, and so on. Because when you get to college, the fact of the matter is, right now, the traditional model is not working. The traditional model is not working because there's debt. There's, here we go with a new workforce model. Let me work with students. We're gonna get them hyped up on all these dreams. We're gonna go to college, it's the answer. Remember, you go to the cathedral, you get admitted, you get to walk on the grass of Stanford, and the output, you're gonna get a good job. And across the country, it's the same thing, right? Well, it's not necessarily the case. In fact, here's a perspective. Right now, there's 864 billion in student debt and 124 million just in private loans. You know, the ones not backed by federal government. So here we go. We get all ramped up, we go into college, we go all through the process, and on the way out, we say, thanks for coming, we're so glad to have you. You're gonna to go to Google and you're gonna get Oh, that's right, you're gonna to have to make a lot more money because you've got $80,000 in student debt, and we're not really preparing you for the workforce. They're gonna to have to teach you about time management skills. We're also gonna teach you the soft skills, and God forbid, uh, you might have an apartment. Now, how many parents? Okay, how many people know somebody that is still out of school and living with their parents? So I just wanna say, it's okay, there's a reason for it. They're saving money. It's our problem, we created it. We created the problem because we strapped so much debt on this, the students, because they went to school, they got all this debt, they came out and they wanted to live the American dream, right? Well, the American dream has changed because we're built on an old model. And who's, wearing the, who's bearing the brunt of this? Not you, it's the students. This is an American problem because it's an economic and a workforce problem. It's not something any industry folks can solve by themselves. Which leads me to the next concept of STEAM, collaboration. We've talked a lot about collaboration today, but I want to talk about the right brain, left brain. And I know we've talked about some engineers, and you hear the word STEM. And STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. So the framework of my department in 2010 that I started, and I alluded back when I had this moment of creating year-round programming, is I didn't want to just follow the traditional model. At that time, No Child Left Behind was actually moving in, and what was an outcome of that was teaching to the test. And in the same process, the erosion of music, arts, and so on eroding. So what happened? Well, not only did we have uh, teaching to the test and a whole other problems, we lost a lot of the artistic design principles that go into thinking with the right brain. The right brain is messy by design. It's, it's crazy. It's where love happens. It's where about thinking about possibilities. You know, you've seen those people talking to themselves, looking about imaginative ideas. In fact, the STEM principle was based on an engineer, but an engineer not by training. You may have heard of him, his name's Leonardo da Vinci. He was a pretty popular engineer, not because he was trained formally, but because he was a naturalist. He went out in nature and looked at birds. He looked at nature and he said, how can I apply these principles in a way that I could transfer into knowledge into the workplace or apply to knowledge? <laughs> Now, I try to describe STEAM in many ways, and sometimes you can think of a prism. And in a prism, you have these colors of light, and on the other side, you have a stream. And that's also another example of the right brain, left brain. It takes a whole different margin of possibilities where creation, where innovation can occur, and synthesizes it into a solution. Now, if you just go look for the solution, the way I describe it, it's the commercial you used to see about Microsoft. Uh, I'm Microsoft, I got Windows, we solved the problem. But then it comes along this guy named Steve Jobs, he, somewhere around Stanford, 
somewhere around here, small company called Apple. And what he said is, it's not good enough to just think about solving the problem. It's how do we connect it to human nature? How do we connect it to our lives? And that principle of STEAM is where we get the innovation and solutions where they bond together. It's the same problem we used to have in early on research. Early on research used to be based on quantitative. You have to have quantitative data. The numbers speak for themselves. If you, don't have, any, if you have anything else, it's not real science. Then came along this crazy notion of, gosh, wouldn't it be interesting if we had conversations with people behind the numbers? And emergence came qualitative research. In that same realm, you have quantitative and qualitative. And today, it's become standard that if you mix actually the mixed methodology of quantitative research and qualitative research, not only do you have an understanding of data, but perhaps you can understand phenomenon behind it. The other things that come along with mixing arts with STEM is that you understand some principles that help with Google's problem, and that's in other in industries, and that they're integrating into their companies now. IDEO, IBM, Boeing, Qualcomm. And that is solving problem means collaboration. And that means taking a philosopher, taking someone from an archaeological perspective and solving a problem along well, alongside with uh, scientists. See, if you're in school and you're learning the, the uh, art of music, you learn that music is code. Music is another way of code. Music also teaches the way of teamwork, how to work with others when harmony comes together. Music also is a baseline in which one has an opportunity to express yourself. And when you actually can do that in music, in art, they use that in play therapy, you get a magic that happens. And today collaboration with the yin and yang is not just a STEAM principle, it's a way of life principle. It's a way of solving problems in industry. It's a way in which we can actually look at better innovations of working politically from right to left. And it also is a way that we can bridge continued education with higher education. Because in the future, it's not just about putting out degrees. It's having the complement of equipping an individual with armor and the tools to do a job. So in closing, I'd just like to note, there is a problem. I think we need to relook at how we measure in metrics and evaluation. I think there's a lot of lessons that we can learn from continuing education. I think we are bridge builders. We need to flip the equation. We need to think about moving from STEM to STEAM. And also, we have the opportunity to go beyond just thinking we're just second to anybody. We are the leaders. We get the students for the rest of their lifetime, and we lend them to higher edu education institutions to get some formal education. Together, harmony occurs, and we're making a better workforce for tomorrow. Thank you. Ed, thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for coming out. This was a wonderful event.